Thank you for listening to the national award-winning PRS Journal Club podcast. I'm happy to present your hosts, Drs. Lily Mundy, Raj Parikh, and Kyle Sena. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the June 2019 edition of PRS Journal Club podcast. I am Kyle Sanek, PRS Resident Ambassador from UT Southwestern, and today I'm joined by my co-resident ambassadors, Lily Mundy from Duke University and Raj Parikh from Washington University in St. Louis. Today we have the honor of being joined by Dr. Paul Sederna, the Robert O'Neill Professor of Plastic Surgery, Chief of the Section of Plastic Surgery, and Professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at the University of Michigan. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Sederna, for this PRS Journal Club podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to the discussion. The articles that we will discuss can be read for free on prsjournal.com, including an archive of all past Journal Club articles. The next article we will be discussing is Surgery for Symptomatic Neuroma, the Anatomic Distribution and Predictors of Secondary Surgery uh, out of Massachusetts General Hospital. The goal of this study was to evaluate the predictive factors uh, for patients who had initial neuromas and who would have to undergo secondary surgeries after their initial surgical intervention for the symptomatic neuroma. A secondary evaluation they were looking for was the anatomic distribution of these neuromas and see what they correlated with. And the authors did this by looking at a retrospective chart review where they targeted all the CPT codes out of 98 different surgeons. The most common symptoms they found were pain, and in total they reviewed 598 patients who had 641 neuromas for a median of five months. Of those patients, 40% underwent pre-op intervention, most commonly as a diagnostic local anesthetic to see if it improved pain. 50% of the neuromas were treated by nerve implantation to muscle and bone, and 20% had an excision of the neuroma only. There was no targeted muscle re or regenerative peripheral nerve interfaces. In terms of anatomic locations, approximately half were in the upper extremity with the most common being digital nerve neuromas, and a little less than half were in the lower extremities with a varying display from perineal, sural, and interdentional nerve neuromas. When they evaluated the causes, they found that symptomatic neuroma was secondary to trauma in 50% of the patients, and it was due to a previous surgery in 38% of patients. In the patients who had primary neuroma, it took 6.4 months from the initial trauma until they had their initial neuroma surgery. And in patients who developed a neuroma after a surgery, they waited an average of 13.4 months before they did any surgical intervention. When they looked at their results, they found that excision or excision with implantation was associated with a higher rate of secondary surgery compared to patients who had excision with direct neurophy with or without nerve grafts. The rate of the secondary surgery in total was 7.8%, and that was averaged out after 16.1 months. Of those secondary surgery patients, 62% of those had excision and implantation alone. So I thought this study was very interesting looking at a, a very complicated problem. Treating pain is always difficult, and there's not always great options for them. And a lot of patients, unfortunately, are pushed aside, and they don't really have a specialty or a surgeon or physician who can treat them. Um, you know, they're kind of passed around as chronic pain patients. So I was very interested in this study for that reason and to see kind of what they found in terms of what causes these neuromas and what causes patients to have these secondary and tertiary surgeries for neuromas. I think there were some limitations to the study. I think the biggest one is the fact that they collected data based on CPT codes and different surgeons code things differently. And the other thing is they had 98 different surgeons, and each surgeon sometimes has varying definitions of what a neuroma is and how they diagnose a neuroma. And there's also no guarantee that they're not missing out on more patients who had some kind of neuroma-type pain that would just miss because they weren't coded properly. So I wanted to turn it over to you, Dr. Sodern, and say, you know, what do you think on this study, and what did you take away from it? I think you've hit on a bunch of really critical topics. You know, any patient with pain has a lot of difficulty finding treatment. Treatment of pain is very frustrating for everyone. It's frustrating for the patients, it's frustrating for the provider, it's frustrating for everybody. And so finding people who are interested in caring for this group of patients is also challenging. For the treatment of neuroma, this is one of those areas where there are about 100 different ways to treat them. There are all the non-operative things that are done to treat neuromas, particularly neuromas following limb loss which include things like work hardening and desensitization. It includes things like mirror box therapy, biofeedback, 
and a series of non-operative things like that. Then of course, there's a series of medications that people use, pregabalin, gabapentin, narcotics, antidepressants, a whole series of things to try to address the pain with medications. Then there are superficial stimulators. There are dorsal column stimulators and then a whole series of operations. So anytime there's a lot of different things that people do to try to treat neuromas, that means that no one thing works the best. And so this article is trying to understand how people have treated neuromas in the past and a large group of people who are all trying to treat the same general condition to determine what the outcomes look like. So there is value when you have a lot of different surgeons trying to treat the same thing because then you can say that the outcomes from the treatment can be applied across the board to the general practitioner. However, when you have a lot of different people, you're exactly right. Everybody diagnoses things in a little bit different way. Everybody treats it in a little bit different way. These patients, particularly patients with limb loss, have neuroma pain. They have phantom pain. They have a lot of different things. And so who gets treatment, who doesn't get treatment. So there's a lot of confounding variables, which makes the data a little bit dirty. However, across the board, when you have this many patients treated, you do have the opportunity to get a general sense of how patients are doing with general approaches to treatment. And so in this case, it appears to me that some of the things that we've done more traditionally to treat neuromas may not be as good as some of the more contemporary ways that we're treating neuromas now. Approaches in the past where you do a high ligation and just leave the end of the nerve away from the end of the residual limb doesn't really prevent neuroma from forming, but maybe it just gets that neuroma a little bit further away from the end of the residual limb. Burying the nerve in muscle or bone that may also protect the end of the nerve from being traumatized in a socket, but it really also, once again, doesn't necessarily prevent the reformation of a neuroma. The new techniques where giving the end of the nerve something to do, approaches like targeted muscle re or regenerative peripheral nerve interfaces, or even some of the nerve graft to nowhere approaches, may give the end of the nerve something to do. And if it gives the end of the nerve something to do, you may be less likely to have an aroma ultimately, and then ultimately reduce your chances of pain. So although there weren't any of those more novel approaches included in this paper, certainly some of the more traditional approaches don't seem to have performed as well as some of the newer approaches where we're trying to repair the nerve in some way or another and basically give that nerve something to do. Yeah, I think that's a great point. That's one of the things when I first started here, I mean, that's kind of the typical thing we did was, you know, for kind of that nerve pain, neuroma type symptoms, you'd excise the nerve and bury it in the, you know, muscle, you know, give it a soft bed so it doesn't scar, quote, scar aggressively into, and that is how you treat it. But I definitely think based on this, taking a little extra time to even just doing a nerve graft to nowhere, basically, it might be better off for patients like this. And if it can help treat their pain, it's, you know, an extra little bit in the operating room might go a long way in terms of their long-term outcomes. Yeah. And so in addition, if you think of the approaches targeted muscle re or regenerative peripheral nerve interfaces, both of those provide the end of the nerve with a bunch of denervated muscle fibers. So when those nerves regenerate, they actually can regenerate and re denervated muscle fibers. And when they re those muscle fibers, it can shut down that additional collateral sprouting, which is happening from those nerves, and then shut down that reformation of the neuroma. The reason that's a little bit different than the traditional approaches of just burying the nerve into a muscle is when you cut a neuroma off and you bury that nerve into the muscle, actually there's nowhere for that nerve to go. There's no muscle to reinnervate because all that muscle is already innervated. And so maybe a few of those nerve branches will fight for a muscle fiber and may win out on a muscle fiber over one of the previously innervated muscle fibers. But overall, there are very few targets for reinnervation. On the other hand, with RPNIs, or TMR, there's a lot of denervated muscle fibers. So it's a real target rich environment for those nerves to re And with that, I think you really are physiologically 
addressing the end of the nerve, giving that nerve something to do and actually shutting off that process of collateral sprouting that leads to the neuromal formation ultimately. And so even with the nerve repairs we see, if you can repair a nerve, by far, that's the best way you can possibly prevent a neuroma from forming. But if you don't have a nerve repair option, there are these other options that are pretty reasonable that I think are a paradigm shift over the way that we've thought about addressing the nerves in the past of like ligating them, burning them, capping them, stepping on them, driving them over with your car, whatever, doing anything to try to crush the end of the nerve, but really that doesn't stop it from sprouting. It'll still sprout no matter what you do. So physiologically, you've got to give it some signals to get it to stop. So how do you go about, but one, diagnosing neuromas? Is it clinical exam? Is it a local anesthetic? And then how are you, like your, your algorithm to treating neuromas? For me, I think it's really tricky. I see a lot of patients with limb loss. And sometimes it's really tough to figure out why they've got limb pain, because they have limb pain for a lot of reasons. Sometimes it just got a whole bunch of scarring in there from their previous trauma that's leading to tethering and pain when they're moving around. Sometimes they have heterotopic ossification that's inducing pain in that residual limb that can look just like neuroma pain and can give you point tenderness just like neuroma pain. Sometimes they have bony outgrowths over the end of their long bones And then their myodesis that's moving back and forth over the end of the bone is catching and giving them pain also. So there's a lot of reasons. So for me, if I can identify point tenderness, so if I can ask them with one finger point to the spot that hurts and I push on that spot and I can make it hurt without them moving around, that gives me a sense that they have an aroma. And then If I can inject that spot and give them an hour or two of relief, I'm pretty confident they've got an aroma. And then for me, what I like to do is if it's really deep and I can't get at it necessarily in the clinic myself, I'll use an ultrasound guided injection that I'll have my PM&R colleagues do for me. And I'll also do MRI neurography which will help me define the pathway of the nerves and look for the neuroma on the end. And then if they have a physical exam that's indicative of a neuroma, and if they have the findings with injection and MRI neurography that that reinforces that diagnosis, then I'll go ahead and do an operation to address it. But it's really tricky sometimes to figure out. Raj, what does Dr. McKinnon have you do at WashU? What are you guys doing for evaluating neuromas and then uh, your treatment algorithm? Yeah, so it's very similar to what Dr. Sederna mentioned. I mean, I think if you can see it, we do less neuromas in limb loss patients, so it's a lot of them are either post-traumatic or post-surgical. But oftentimes, you know, if you can diagnose it on a clinical exam, clearly, you know, and you can elicit pain on exam, that's obviously the most beneficial or the most direct diagnosis. And then we do block them. If we can do that, you know, with a local anesthetic, you get relief, and, you know, I think it gives you a kind of a clear idea that that is where neuroma is. And then if you can't, you know, then we go to some of the more advanced imaging techniques. But I think a lot of it just relies on clinical exam and then if patients can get symptomatic relief from a local anesthetic in the area. And then, you know, often we'll take patients for surgical exploration if they have a clear-cut symptoms and they've been suffering for a while. You know, I think Dr. McKinnon's philosophy is certainly trust a patient and if somebody has been suffering for a long time, you know, it's worth it for an exploration and more often than not, you know, we will find an aroma. And then our treatment algorithm is pretty similar to what Dr. Sardona mentioned with the big caveat that, you know, we don't do RPNI currently. So what we'll do for most of our neuromas now, you know, we do neurectomy, crush and burn, you know, that was the traditional method, but you know, for the last several years, we've been putting them into longer allografts. So we use nerve cadaveric, you know, like oxygen or something in a, a long graph typically longer than five centimeters, so a six centimeter graft, um, and we'll do a uh, co-optation into that, and then the end of that nerve graft goes into muscle. So it gives it somewhere for the nerve to go. You know, we still do the other elements, we still crush it proximally, we still transpose it, but then we co-opt it to a long nerve graft, and the hope is that it just kind of petters out inside of that graft over time. And, and that's what I think we've had the best results with recently. You know, we did look at the literature and compare kind of all the different techniques that were reported and wrote about that. And there really wasn't much difference um, in surgical treatments with the understanding that there's so much heterogeneity in the data and the way people report outcomes 
and their techniques. So it's very challenging to really have good outcomes data on this topic. So obviously your group at WashU is obviously some of the world's experts on nerve and it's quite clear that there are a lot of people that know a lot about nerve that have different opinions about this, which means that there isn't a clear cut answer yet. So this is one of those topics that is perfect for a multi-center clinical trial head to head where everyone's doing the exact same thing, you know, and then you're looking at patient reported outcome measures of satisfaction and in pain measures and in pain interference measures and all the various things that can assess the outcome. This is, this is perfect for that kind of a study, for sure. Lily, are they doing anything to try to decrease the risk of neuromas at Duke or are they treating everything kind of similar to how Dr. Sederna and Raj is treating them? Yeah, so in terms of neuroma treatment, I think, you know, we just have a variety of different surgeons that are doing that here, and I think their practices are sort of reflective of what you've all discussed. Not to my knowledge, at least, no one has started doing RPNI, but we have really started to do a lot of TMR here. Our hospital system has been working on limb salvage and amputations, and so it's sort of become part of our protocol to at least offer, have a discussion about TMR to almost all of our limb loss patients. So that will be really interesting to see as those patients are undergoing amputations, and many of them are electing to have TMRs, to sort of see how that evolves for them. Dr. Studen, I was curious. I know the time they found for reoperation or time between surgeries was, I think they cited 16.1 months. Do you feel like this is sort of a long time for these patients or does this make sense just based on how difficult it can be to come up with a diagnosis and potentially, you know, patients switching surgeons during this time if they're feeling frustrated? That's one of the biggest challenges of all for neuroma treatment is, first of all, any study that isn't at least a year out is too early to tell. And there's a lot of papers that are published earlier than that describing outcomes and it's just too early to know. Second of all, if a patient has pain, if they've had an operation, they have pain, they don't necessarily go back to the same surgeon. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, but there was a very famous surgeon at the American Society for Peripheral Nerve Meeting that said that they treated neuromas in a certain way. When the first surgeon said that it worked every time, and there was a second very famous peripheral nerve surgeon sitting there going, no, it doesn't work every time because when they fail you, they all come to see me. And <laughs> it was absolutely hilarious to hear that discussion, but that's one of the realities of operations when you're doing procedures to treat pain. The one thing I will say as an aside is, I do believe there's lots of neuromas from surgery. In fact, Dave Brown here at the University of Michigan does a lot of operations for pain and he's seeing a lot of intercostal neuromas after breast surgery, lots of groin pain after inguinal hernias that he's treating neuromas for. So there's a lot of people with a lot of pain that's neuroma pain but isn't recognized as neuroma pain. He's actually making great inroads with that group of patients. I will also say for patients undergoing amputations, when you do operations at the time of their amputations to try to prevent neuroma formation, that is a game changer. So we've done now about 200 patients. We've done RPNIs on patients with limb loss. And when we do it at the time of amputation, it is a game changer. They have no neuroma pain and their phantom pain is substantially reduced. So it really makes a big difference. So I think as we start thinking more and more about improving outcomes, we have to be doing more things upfront prophylactically to prevent them from getting in that position of having horrible pain and then having that pain centralize and becoming more and more difficult to treat down the road. So, Overall, it's a long-term problem for these poor patients. And the more that we can do for them earlier, the better off they're gonna do. So Dr. Sedona, you mentioned, so like when people are getting uh, below knee amputations or above knee am uh, these amputations, is your group doing the initial amputation or are you doing it in a combination case with either the vascular surgeons, general surgeons, orthopedic surgeons, whichever surgeon is doing the amputation, are you just there to then take care of the nerve and do the RPNIs or are you doing the amputation itself? We do a lot of the primary amputations. We do everything from below knees, above knees. We do hip disarticulations. We do transradial transhumerals and glenohumeral lamps. So we do all of those. However, for the cancer operations, the ortho-oncologists are doing those. And for some of the vascular patients, the vascular surgeons are doing those and we're helping them. So tomorrow, actually, I'm going and helping one of the vascular surgeons who's doing a below knee amputation. I'm gonna take care of the patient's nerves at the time. But we do a lot of primary amputations as well because as plastic surgeons, 
we are really good at managing soft tissues and we're really good at managing muscle flaps and things like that. I think that sometimes the operations that we do, we spend a little bit more time worrying about the reconstruction of the residual limb and doing a really good myodesis and contouring the muscles in such a way that they have a really good weight bearing residual limb when they're done. So I think they're good operations for us to do. I think they're great from an anatomic perspective. The anatomy is amazing. You get to see everything perfectly well. And so overall, they're good operations. So we do a lot of primary amputations, but also assist the other surgeons at the time. Yeah, that's been one of the hardest things, at least at Parkland and UT, to get kind of the RPNIs, TMRs going is just the amputations. It's hard to either take those over or encourage collaboration sometimes, you know, with the, getting the schedules aligned up when you know, you've had decades of precedent being set of, you know, this group does the amputations. And so it's very interesting to hear you say that. Did you have any issues initially starting that or were you always doing the primary amputation so it wasn't as big of a hurdle to climb? It's really interesting. We were doing RPNIs for prosthetic control, but along the way, one of the more senior physical medicine rehabilitation doctors said, I know you want to control prosthetic devices and that's great, but I have all these patients with neuromas. Why don't you just do it to treat neuromas? I guess it's about 2014. We did the first one just to treat neuroma and the patients did great. So after that, I sent a note to ortho, I sent a note to vascular, I sent a note to everyone saying, I will do every one of your amputations if you don't want to do it. And just send the patients to me, I got it. And what happened is a lot of surgeons sent them to me because a lot of surgeons don't want to do the amputations. And so it was relatively easy to do. But then they came and they watched us do regenerative peripheral nerve interfaces and they saw that it was relatively easy and so they said, well, you know, maybe we'll just do the amputations ourselves, and we'll do those ourselves." And so a lot of the surgeons have now gone back to doing the amputations. But in general, it isn't the operation that a lot of the orthopedic surgeons want to do and a lot of the vascular surgeons want to do. But that's how we change those patterns because you're exactly right. It is so challenging when you have a bunch of busy surgeons to try to get schedules coordinated. But for the patients, I mean, it makes such a huge difference for them. It is worth the effort for sure, because it's a game changer for them. Well, I'm definitely inspired to see if I can go talk with some of our colleagues here at UT to see if we can increase the collaboration with some of the uh, amputations that are going on here. Uh, any other thoughts, uh, Dr. Sederna, on the article or anything else you'd like to impart on the uh, podcast listeners? A good article that you read in the journal, I mean, PRS is such an amazing journal that, you know, the impact factor is higher than it's ever been. It is by far the most read plastic surgery journal in the world and the quality of the science is amazing. But when you read a good article, you should have more questions when you're done reading the article than you had before you started reading the article. Because now that I read this, there's so many more questions I have and there's so many more things that I think that we need to do because this article is a great springboard for designing bigger studies, better studies, studies that can dissect out all the various confounding variables and, and allow us to answer the most difficult questions that we have facing us in our field. And so it's another really good article. It's a pleasure to read it. And, and I got to tell you, it, it really motivates me to really want to do that big multi-center clinical trial looking at outcomes in aroma and really just go head to head with a, a number of the more common treatment modalities and see which one helps patients the most. I look forward to reading that study for you, Dr. Sederna. Hey, it'll be a couple days. I think with that, we will end the discussion of this article. Thank you everyone for a great discussion. If you like this podcast, please feel free to share with your colleagues and friends and rate us on the Apple iTunes store. Also remember to tune in to the other two articles that we will be discussing on this month's podcast. Finally, please join us for our monthly journal club on Facebook, where we will be able to interact directly in real time with this month's selected articles authors. Go ahead and like the Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery Facebook page if you have not done so already. It is there where our monthly journal club takes place. And once again, thank you so much, Dr. Sederna, for joining us. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. It's been a fun discussion. Thanks for listening to the award-winning PRS Journal Club podcast. Please click, subscribe, and leave a ratings or review if you're enjoying what we do every day.